thank you all for showing up today. Uh, my name is Brian Stinson. Uh, my day job is working on uh, RHEL 10. I'm the RHEL 10 development lead at Red Hat. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit of, uh, to you about uh, what might be coming for RHEL 11. And the honest answer is I really don't know uh, because it's pretty early. But one of the most important things that we found over uh, the past two cycles of developing Red Hat Enterprise Linux is that we need to build a procedure to kind of keep things going. And that's why I titled this, uh, the, subtitled this talk, Keeping the Flywheel Turning, because I, what I was thinking about at the time was when I was a sysadmin, I worked for a, a university uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, in our Unix data center, at, at the very bottom floor of uh, one of the buildings, uh, we had uh, an uninterruptible power supply that was powered by this gigantic wheel. I, I couldn't even tell you how much it weighs. But the important thing was that, that little uh, changes uh, sort of stacked up over time, uh, cranking that flywheel, sort of smoothed out the, the power distribution for the entire data center. It's all about little changes at the beginning uh, to keep things going whenever, uh, whenever you have little bumps. And that was something that we noticed uh, in, in some of the earlier releases of RHEL. Uh, we would, you know, uh, th there would be a time when we come and, and fork from Fedora. It's a big activity, uh, lots of, uh, of uh, hoopla around getting things imported and, and ready for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But that, uh, we found some challenges with that as uh, things went forward. And so to talk about how, uh, how things are going, we, we actually have to go back to RHEL 8. And uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, RHEL 8.10 released uh, just a little while ago. It's the last in the series of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, regular development for the RHEL 8 release. It's in its maintenance phase right now. But there was something that was really important about RHEL 8. And uh, if you go back to the launch in 2019, uh, this is the, uh, the stage at Red Hat Summit where we uh, unveiled everything. One of the important announcements that we made at Summit was that Red Hat Enterprise Linux would, become, uh, would be on a predictable cadence. And uh, that was surprising and scary to us at the time. Because previous releases, we didn't, uh, we didn't really know when the, the next major would come. But here we're saying that Red Hat Enterprise Linux is going to come up with an, a new major release every three years. And that, uh, that sort of started a chain reaction. We did pretty good with that. Uh, the, the regular Mel RHEL major releases you know, started with RHEL 8. Uh, GA was in 2019. Uh, 2019. And you can see. You know, ab about every six Fedora releases, we, uh, we ended up forking. 2022 brought us RHEL 9 from uh, Fedora 34. And then RHEL 10, we expect uh, in 2025, uh, based on Fedora 40. But that, uh, that, that sort of leads to some interesting questions. Like, how do we keep this going for multiple releases uh, in the future? You can see there's a lot of overlap, too. Like, there's a lot of activity going on at once. And so that's why it's important to have processes where little changes amplify into a big impact whenever there's variance in the amount of work to do. Uh, and, and so I, I kind of want to take a little bit of a detour, because I'm sure that some of you uh, are, are coming to this talk wondering how RHEL 10 is going. Uh, and I, I do want to do a couple of, uh, of special shout outs to, uh, uh, to some of the folks that are working on that. Let's talk about some important features uh, that you might, might notice. Uh, this is in RHEL 10 uh, the, that we expect to, to release uh, next year sometime. We're making major changes. And these are important to notice. Uh, we're sort of relying on the fact that that predictable release schedule lets us make, I don't know, maybe more surprising changes uh, in future major releases, because we know that there's going to be an opportunity uh, to you know, stay on an older release for a while, but also to keep moving uh, as we go forward. And so in RHEL 10, we, uh, we expect uh, Wayland to replace XORG. Uh, we're getting rid of 32-bit of multi-lib, because if you, if you think about how the 10-year life cycle, 
if we release in 2025, uh, that puts us pretty close to uh, the end of when we can represent uh, uh, timestamps in 32-bit in format. So we have to make really uh, uh, decisions really, really far, that affect us really, really far in the future right now. And that's why, uh, so making large changes on a predictable schedule is, uh, is sort of so important. And this one is also a controversial one. Uh, so if you're, if you're out there looking for uh, some of the, um, uh, the things going on in the community space that represent RHEL 10, uh, we have bumped up to the x86 v3 architecture baseline. And uh, what that means is uh, you know, some of the, the older hardware that might be supported on other releases of Red Hat Enterprise Linux may not work anymore. But you can, uh, you can sort of rely on some of the other uh, previous releases if you, uh, if you have that sort of thing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the question is, is there a, a technical reason for uh, kicking out uh, V2 and, and moving to a V3 baseline? And that's, a, that's a really good question. It's, there's not any one specific, specific technical reason, but when you combine it with some of the other, um, uh, the other pieces of the hardware catalog that we want to support for Red Hat Enterprise Linux specifically, this kind of lets us uh, uh, get, you know, wh whatever performance gains we can get out of moving to an architecture baseline but it's, it's aligned with the rest of the strategy. And so moving along to other hardware that, um, that is, is gonna make it into the catalog, we, we found that there's a lot of, uh, of hardware that we, um, that we don't wanna support anyways. And so moving to a V3 baseline kind of lets us keep this moving forward uh, going on in the future. And so if you're, uh, if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, that's when you can sort of rely on the, uh, the long life cycle of previous RHEL releases to uh, to keep you going. Uh, and then, so if you're, uh, yeah, if you're interested in features like that and seeing how this might impact your environment, you know, uh, like I said, we're not releasing RHEL 10 for another, uh, I don't know, year or so. Um, but you can try it now in CentOS Stream. And uh, you can get the bits out there. Um, uh, Adam's sitting right in the middle. I'm going to point you out there. Uh, He's, uh, he, he, he runs the, the CentOS stream team there, but uh, they just announced that they have uh, signed uh, content, signed composes, and it's available in the, the special interest group uh, build system in the CentOS space. And so I want to get into a couple of lessons that we learned uh, from doing the, the RHEL 10 uh, bring up specifically, and then we'll, we'll get into some uh, so maybe uh, some philosophy of what we want to do going forward. Uh, so lesson one, three years is enough to make a really, really big difference. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, you know, some of the, the general characteristics of uh, some of the, the recent uh, 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 regular releases of RHEL here in just a minute. But what we found is like three years is a pretty good amount of time between majors to kind of differentiate them enough, but you know, not have, uh, have too much uh, in the way of a bring up. And so one thing we were, we've been continuing on, uh, you know, starting in RHEL 9, but uh, mostly uh, in RHEL 10, one of the themes was minimization. And uh, just to give you some numbers, um, whenever we actually go into pulling in a number of packages into a major release, Again, we've forked from Fedora uh, source code and then you know, build it in the, the RHEL build system and then import that and uh, you know, kind of mess around with the content set for a while and then uh, we end up getting it released. But at import time, uh, during RHEL 9, the, the RHEL 9 timeframe, uh, about, eh, if you put yourself uh, you know, today, three years ago, uh, it was a little bit before this time, but about now, we imported 5,185 packages but on release day, uh, we only released 2,318 of them. So that was a wild uh, activity that we had to do during RHEL 9 development. It was a lot of work for maintainers to, to do, and they didn't have a lot of time to do it because uh, you know, if you think the, there's only a couple of cycles that you have uh, to basically get rid of half of the package set. 
one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that we did in the rel 10 timeframe is we spread out that minimization activity. And I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit about uh, how that works in, in just a minute, or we'll talk about it. And so at import time for, for rel 10, uh, you can see we imported 2,518 packages. Uh, and right now in the build system, there's 2,389 of them. And the fr uh, one of the things that we do to import all of this content is we kick off a mass rebuild. During this mass rebuild, we only noticed four packages that failed to build from source. So if you all could give a, a, like a huge hand to the Bootstrap team right now, like that was a huge accomplishment. So thank you very much for that. So this was a, uh, this was a, really, um, a, a really good way for us to make a huge impact over you know, a reasonable amount of time, three years or so since uh, we had to deal with RHEL 9 activities. But three years isn't that long after all, uh, because one of the things that we noticed um, it, you know, as part of, uh, of the RHEL 10 cycle, we experimented, with a, we experimented with an idea of not doing an alpha. So after the import process, we fork from Fedora, we bring things into the, uh, you know, inside the firewall, we build them, uh, things like that. Typically, we would have a phase where we go through uh, uh, an, an alpha. It's a, you know, sort of a, a thing that we put together like we would put to the, the whole product together. We didn't do that this time around. Uh, we found that, uh, you know, a lot of those activities uh, we could actually accomplish in Fedora ELN and CentOS Stream, which we'll, we'll talk about here in just a minute. But we found it isn't really that long after all. And so one of the things that I, I, I'd like to ask of you, the community, uh, and uh, you know, us as, as Red Hat, let's find a way to work together to, to sort of make some of those, uh, those bootstrapping efforts and infrastructure efforts a little bit easier over the next uh, you know, four or five years as we head on to RHEL 11. And so if you take yourself back to the, the RHEL 8 timeframe, we didn't really have sort of an organized effort to, uh, to do the, the bootstrap process, or even to do the, the minor release development process. That came later. And so one of the lessons that we're actually building on uh, you know, in RHEL 10 and then moving forward to RHEL 11 is that there has to be a place for everything. Like I said, it starts in Fedora ELN. Um, you can think of this as sort of shaped like the next RHEL major release. And CentOS Stream uh, does you know, play a part in that, but we'll get there in just a minute. You can think of it as for Fedora Rawhide built like RHEL with RHEL compiler flags, uh, rel options, uh, you know, rel uh, specific, um, uh, you know, ideally we'd, we'd have the, the same uh, system D defaults, you know, all of those things that make up uh, the differences between Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, features actually flow primarily from the community space. We do allow for some Red Hat specific changes, though, just because of the way that we, uh, that we want to direct Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you know, we contribute those back to the ELN project in a way that doesn't affect what Fedora wants to do. But the features themselves come from Fedora. It's literally the Fedora Rawhide code built with RHEL options. And the, the code is synchronized from, from Rawhide, and like I said, we, we can diverge that, uh, the different pieces of code in limited circumstances whenever we sort of make different decisions uh, than you know, what might be appropriate for Fedora. And I mentioned that, uh, that one of our focuses was minimization uh, across the RHEL 9 and RHEL 10 timeframes. Um, the, the place where you'll see that the most uh, prominently, I guess you'd say, uh, the Fedora ELN project is a great place to, uh, to sort of look at that content set in Content Resolver. This is the tool that we use to, uh, to sort of notice dependencies, uh, remove things that aren't you know, really useful, and uh, mark things as uh, you know, available or unavailable as, uh, as, as we develop the content set for the next major release. And so this is one area where we want to continue uh, again, 
small changes made over time have a really big impact, and Content Resolver is one of those small changes that, uh, that we want to continue over the next, uh, next number of years. So if you want to check it out, there's a, a URL up there. Uh, you can see the different uh, workloads and views that apply to ELN and some of our other, uh, our other properties there. And so, uh, like I said, a place for everything. Fedora ELN is where we develop features you know, long before the next major release and sort of kick off the bootstrap. There's a handoff there. Uh, as soon as we're done with, uh, you know, we're ready to make that, that fork, we actually need a place to develop the next minor release of RHEL, and that's CentOS Stream. So we've got active releases for, uh, that are targeting RHEL 9, and uh, CentOS Stream 10, targeting RHEL 10, uh, like I said, is available right now. And it's code forked from Fedora ELN at you know, different points in time, uh, ideally every three years. It's got the, uh, the rel compiler flags and the content set. And so while we're shaping the, uh, the set of packages that goes into Fedora ELN, one of the things that we solidify in CentOS Stream during the bootstrap period is the, the content set and the content split. Uh, you, you may notice if you're, uh, if you're a RHEL user, you've got different repositories for BaseOS, AppStream, and CodeReady Linux Builder, and, and things like that. This is where we, uh, we kind of negotiate on where some of that stuff lives before we, we go GA. In CentOS Stream, the features are, are delivered primarily by Red Hat, um, but they're done in a way uh, the, the Red Hat maintainers do things in a way that is uh, you know, exactly like a, a third-party contributor might do. And so you all can go out and, and uh, contribute code just like a RHEL maintainer does day to day uh, in this space right here. And that's important because uh, you know, doing things in the open, doing them in the exact same way that uh, someone unaffiliated with Red Hat might do, it, it lets us talk about things in a shared language and, uh, and, and sort of uh, help each other out with, uh, with getting changes through. This is where we get a little bit more restrictive on the, thing, the kinds of things that we accept into the, uh, the, the distribution. Like I said, the, the features are delivered primarily by Red Hat, and um, that means that the maintainers sort of control the process here. Um, and so if you want to get something into CentOS Stream uh, 9 or 10 at this point, the best thing you can do is open up a bug and start a conversation uh, and do that first uh, before you start writing code and, and things like that, because that'll be the, uh, the path for success there. Uh, and then finally, we've got Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, this is honestly probably the, uh, the most boring part for this, this talk here because we've already curated the code in two different places. We've got the, the major release bring up in Fedora ELN. We've got the minor release bring up in, uh, in CentOS Stream. And then we just reuse that, uh, that code to put out Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We do have, uh, you know, as we go past GA, we have uh, you know, a limited set of patches that maintainers deal with for our extended update streams. Uh, but those are uh, those are disconnected and um, and usually they're they're all derived from uh, the sources that we have out in public, and this is collated by Red Hat internally. So uh, most of the development work that you're seeing is actually in uh, in ELN or or CentOS Stream. So that's that's kind of how we do development. Uh, that's kind of how we do the bootstrap work, but. That's kind of, I guess you'd call it, uh, you know, internally facing. We're looking at how we deal with uh, with change over time for the operating system. But the problem is, uh, if we're talking in terms of like, you know, three years or six years or or something like that, the industry changes, right? Uh, sometimes more often than we expect it to. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to sort of do, this is just an example. It was an easy example for me to, uh, to sort of pull from. I wanted to look at some of the keynote uh, titles at Red Hat Summit and then just kind of distill them for you. 
And there's, a, uh, there's definitely a through line for each of these, these titles, um, but you'll see some differences here. Going back to, to 2018, um, that was when you know, we, were, we were starting to talk, or, or primarily talking about the open hybrid cloud. And you can think of that as, as just uh, you know, a way to, uh, to deal with on-premise infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that's in each of the individual clouds in the same way. And you know, that's, that is kind of the through line here. You can see that in, uh, in most of the titles. And again, I, I paraphrase these a little bit. But 2019, we started talking about digital transformations. That's things like, uh, you know, our, um, our organizations looking towards containerization and uh, you know, other ways of, uh, of dealing with infrastructure that aren't necessarily uh, bare metal machines or virtual machines or, or something like that. Um, it's also a little bit about uh, you know, cloudification of, uh, of all of these services. You can see that in, in 2020, it was interesting, we started talking about edge technologies. Uh, 2021 is kind of when you get a little bit of a flavor of uh, the, uh, the AI stuff that we didn't know was coming uh, because we started talking about hardware accelerators and, and things like that. And then uh, 2022, 2023, 2024 is uh, when we started talking about artificial intelligence and, and some of those themes happening in the industry. And you know, whether you, you buy into the AI stuff or not, a, a distribution like RHEL or you know, Fedora or you know, any of the other ones out there exists to, uh, to sort of support many of these workloads. And uh, in many cases, we have to, uh, to sort of support these over a, a, a number of different years and releases. And so we're still thinking about things that are uh, that were highlighted back in 2018 and even earlier. If you can think of uh, other industry trends that happened, you know, back in the 2016 timeframe, if you were to, uh, to sort of put yourself in that frame, things we were talking about at the time are blockchain, speech recognition, quantum computing, data analytics, and deep learning. And those are still, they may not be quite so buzzwordy today, but those are still things that people are doing out in their organizations, and it's important for us to keep both the old and the new in mind. And that's why it's important for us to, uh, to have a way of making changes uh, to our own operating system uh, to support you know, whatever might be coming next. And so we know that RHEL 11 will come at some point, but we don't know what will be important at the time. And you know some things uh, within our own ecosystem that um, in the the distribution ecosystem that we couldn't have predicted are things like bootable containers or AI stacks with exo exotic packaging problems. You can think of PyTorch and you know all of those things that are uh, a little bit tricky uh, to package into a, a traditional RPM. And that's that's kind of uh, why it's so important that we do all of this stuff out in the community space. Because another lesson that, that we can learn from you know, this whole uh, activity of doing development is that a distribution is more like a garden than a painting, right? A painting, you can go in, into your studio and you get your paint out as an individual artist and you write some things on a canvas and you know, eventually you sell it for millions of dollars, I hope. But a garden is a little bit more um, uh, it, it, it requires more maintenance over time, and it's, it, it sort of renews itself uh, with the work that you put into it over, uh, over time. I'll give you an example. Uh, so this is, um, this is a map of a community garden that's in my, uh, my town. And basically what you do, there's a process to sign up for your own little plot, uh, and you know, there's a number of them here. One of my neighbors has one of these plots, and you know we go out and and sort of uh, check on the flowers and and all of that stuff. But the important part about this is you've got your own individual space where you can work on whatever it is that you want to. Uh, you know you can grow potatoes or uh, a set of wildflowers or uh, you know beans. It doesn't really matter. You've got your own individual space, but you're contributing to a, a like a whole community 
And in this instance, you've got a, a set of those individual spaces that are focused on whatever is important to you. Uh, but this group of folks uh, have banded together and decided that organic farming is, uh, is important to them. And they've, they've kind of grouped themselves together. And that's why it's so important to do things like this in a place like Fedora, because Fedora it acts very much like a community garden. You've got your own space. You can work on whatever it is that's important to you or to your organization. But you can group together as uh, an interest group. Special interest groups are, are a, an amazing way to share ideas, share tools, just like these folks do in the community garden. And so if I had some, uh, some advice for you, uh, maybe three things to do, because we have no idea what's coming uh, in the next few years, use Fedora ELN and CentOS Stream in your own environment. If you're using Fedora right now, try an ELN system and see if it, it, it runs the same things that you, uh, you might care about. If you're running a RHEL system, try CentOS Stream so you can notice what features are coming in the next minor release and tell us about it. Uh, file bugs in, in, in Jira or in Bugzilla, or uh, you know, just let us know about uh, how your experience is going. Like I said, participate in a Fedora SIG. Uh, those are great ways to notice those industry trends that we were talking about. And we want to be sure we, have, we cover as much uh, of those trends as possible in a special interest group so that we have the experts available uh, whenever we need to, to sort of call on them to, uh, to make a wider effort within the Fedora project. And the most important one, uh, and I know Aoife has got a talk uh, right on this, uh, this slot, so if you should go back and watch the, the video afterwards, uh, but use the Fedora change process. Because one thing that, we're, um, that we'd like to do in the RHEL 11 timeframe is a kind of work on some of the communication, both from Fedora to Red Hat, but Red Hat to Fedora. If you think of the, the, uh, the most recent releases, you can kind of think, I think of them in, in sort of a few different themes. The way that we've communicated in the past um, is, you know, in the RHEL 9 timeframe, we were kind of building things as they go. And so we wanted to make RHEL development contributable. You can come and, and bring things, uh, you know, to Red Hat and we, uh, you know, we'd in incorporate them as, uh, you know, if we, if we can. In RHEL 10, we made uh, uh, RHEL development continuous. That was, you know, we started the flywheel turning with ELN, CentOS Stream, and those handoffs. In RHEL 11, I'd really like to see us make RHEL development collaborative. And doing that in a, in a way that is similar to the Fedora change process is something I'm going to be thinking about quite a bit over the next few years. I don't know what the details look like yet, but uh, I, I feel like there needs to be a little bit more cross-collaboration on the things that we can talk about publicly, because that's the best way to, to move forward. And so two final uh, uh, calls to action here. Tell me what you think will be important for RHEL 11. Tell me what you think the workloads are going to be like in three years. Hit me up at, at bstinson at redhat.com, and we'll start a, a, a conversation about that. And then finally, uh, one thing I like to do at the end of, of my talks is have uh, two questions for the audience. You can answer them here if you want to. Just stick up your hand and, and tell me what you think, uh, or you know, send it to my email uh, after the fact. Um, number one, have you tried Fedora ELN or CentOS Stream, and what surprised you the most? And with that, uh, I'll take any comments or questions that you might have. Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, the question was, are there any revolutionary ideas for RHEL 11? Uh, are we thinking about uh, you know, entirely changing the way that we deliver the operating system or anything like that? The, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, and that's OK. Like, that's OK. We're, we're making changes. So things like the, the, uh, uh, the boot C container space uh, it's happening right now, it kind of allows us to, uh, to do things in parallel with the existing RPM installation. And so 
like maybe it'll be ready by that that time. Maybe it won't. Like it's uh, it's one of those things that we can uh, can sort of keep in touch with on the way. The 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 primary thing uh, to notice about uh, the the three year cadence is it does allow us to kind of smooth over some of those large jumps. And so if you think of going from rel seven to rel eight where we made the system D change or, or things like that, we can be a little bit more um, uh, you know, thoughtful about which major changes you know, need to happen right now versus uh, in a future release. And it gives us more opportunities to make large changes whenever they're ready. Yeah. 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 So the the question is: Is there pl are, are there plans to um, uh, to improve the upgrade process for when you're you're sort of trying to target an application for a particular release? And uh, there's uh, you know there's definitely some things we can do in the upgrade space, but if you're looking from a rel perspective, one of the things that we're looking at for um, you know, RHEL 10, but also future releases, is to try and help people make that decision for themselves. Because, you know, keep in mind, RHEL 9 is still fully supported for uh, until 2032, and it's perfectly okay uh, to target your application for that as long as it meets your your lifecycle needs. And so, it's a, a little bit of both, like making uh, you know some improvements to the upgrade process, but also helping. You know, you as uh, as sort of the the architect, try and figure out which lifecycle fits you the best and which features you might need to to support your application. Yeah. 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 So the uh, I, I guess the comment was that um, you know lots of lots of folks are having trouble working with their vendors because the their, the vendors might require uh, or, or certify on RHEL seven and you know really old releases, and I think that's um, that's kind of we're at the we're at the beginning of a process here. Even though you know RHEL eight is has gone into maintenance mode, uh, this predictable cadence. Like I, I expect more vendors to. Uh, to sort of pick up on our regular cadence and be able to to uh, to certify it more quickly. That's something that w I know it's not anywhere close to real, but that's the that's the vision is that they would uh, the the vendors themselves would start paying attention earlier as we make changes. So again, I don't have a, a an immediate answer for your customers, and I'm sure that they're uh, they're they're looking into our extended, extended options uh, at this point. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So anything, if you look in the actual config files right now, uh, there, there are a set of tags on there, and anything tagged for ELN is now the RHEL 11 content set, uh, what we expect to be in there. And we expect to iterate on that over time. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 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 question is: uh, Are we are we planning on making Content Resolver influence the Compose configuration process so that uh, you only have to do one change and then notice it in the in the repos? And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, like honestly, there's a lot of metadata that we have to uh, to store and curate about the different components in uh, ELN, Stream, and RHEL, and we're looking at ways to to influence that so you make one update. 
and it just updates the compose configs for you. So but that's a, a that's a process that we're working through. Yeah. 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 So the the question is, um, we used to have um, in in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we used to have uh, application streams that we would deliver through, uh, or you know, earlier releases had software collections and modules and things like that. Um, so in in RHEL 10, we're not doing we're, we're not releasing things as modules at all. Um, modularity isn't a technology that we're looking into for, for dealing with application streams. Most developers right now are looking at doing named RPMs for, uh, for those different versions. And so you can think of like, you know, Python 3.9, Python 3.12, that sort of things. Those are separate RPMs. We don't have anything in the, I know there's another talk uh, that I'm gonna catch uh, later at DevConf about uh, some interesting ideas there, but I don't think we have any concrete plans to replace either of those technologies. And I see that I'm out of time, so uh, I will see if we can wrap it there. Thanks, folks. <laughs>